Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. So, engagers, welcome. Today we have something interesting once again. It seems like we're in kind of a, I don't know, like a rant of talking to people who are in gamification and games in the medical field, because today we have Michael. But Michael, before we get started, are you prepared to engage? Yes, I am. (laughs) Michael Cassimini is an assistant professor at the clinical pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California, and of course, also an attending physician at the Children's Hospital Los Angeles. He's a contributor and associated producer of the Pediatric Continuing Medical Education podcast, Pediatrics Reviews and Perspectives, and also the designer of Empiric Pediatric, which is a two to four player card game used to teach guideline-based antibiotic use for medical students and residents. And is there anything else, you know, you um, that we're missing from that intro you'd like to point out? Oh, I think that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so, Michael, can you tell us, like, what is a, a, you know, a typical schedule for you look like? I know you're in paternity leave right now, but maybe, you know, pre-paternity leave and maybe even pre, <laughs> pre all this yeah. madness of the coronavirus. How, how does that look like for you? Yeah, I only know what it was like before. You know, I'm I'm a clinical faculty, so my primary role is to see patients. So I I'm lucky to work in a hospital where we're still allowed to do outpatient work with children as well as inpatient work. So I take care of hospitalized children, both outpatient in our clinic as well as um, when they stay in the hospital. And the bulk of that work is done in an educational setting, either supervising resident doctors, so doctors who have finished their medical school here in the American system, or medical students who are um, still in their medical school at CAC. Nice. Um, I do, you know, I have a little bit of time for research and for developing new curriculum. And I do a little bit of work in utilization management. So like reviewing authorizations for studies and such too. So get a nice variety in my day. Seems like you have a lot to do in every day, you know. <laughs> There's quite a few things that you can dig into, which is always an interesting, uh, you know, position to be at where you sort of not get bored, but, you know, you want to get a little change and you have all these different things to do for sure. So, Michael, we would like to know of a, of a, a time, you know, a situation in which you maybe would like to call your favorite fail or first attempt in learning. Of a time, of course, you were maybe creating some sort of educational experience or similar, especially if it involves games or gamification. And, you know, at some point you had some failure, which, of course, as usual, is not fatal, is not definitive. <laughs> and, of course, we want to be there with you. We want to live that story and, and learn from those situations with you. Yeah, I I think I'm still kind of midway through my best and first fail. For the last two years, I've been building this card game that I use to teach medical students and residents, you know, appropriate use of antibiotics that they don't really learn in medical school, kind of bridging that gap from what they learn about, you know, what the drugs are, a bacteria the drugs kill, how the drugs get into the body, that kind of, you know, basic information they learn in medical school and bridging that to like, hey, how do we really use them in real life? So I've been working on a card game to teach that. And at first, this was something I was just doing for myself, and I used it over and over again with my students and felt pretty good about how it worked for me to teach. But I found that I would have I have like scripts that I would eventually end in and I would say the same thing every time a certain card came up and I would have my own sort of teaching points, my own sort of way of using it as a teaching tool. And as I started to think about how am I going to get this game to be usable to other people, I thought, well, I'm not going to come in that box. And how can I share that information? I was discussing it with someone and they said, well, I'll just put some QR codes on there and you can put as much as you want to online. I'm like, perfect. And I jumped right in when they said that. And at the time, the cards, I think I had 120 cards in the deck and 50 of them were cases, which I thought the QR codes would help with. So I jumped right in. I put QR codes on 50 cards. I wrote a couple paragraphs online for each of them with references. I basically wrote a little textbook that came online with the game and you know, there's been a lot of iterations since then, but I, I kept that effort into the game until now. And now that people are getting their own copies and using them themselves, those QR codes are not being used. So I put this, I, there's probably lots of people who write little textbooks that no one reads, <laughs> but I've done it and I'm very aware that no one's reading it because I can see that people are not clicking those links. 
And I think that's something that I definitely am learning from right now. And if you had, of course, the opportunity to do it again, and you were kind of there, is there something that you would maybe from the get go, something that you would have done differently in that sense? I don't know, for incentivizing people to do to either to read those texts or never to create them or do something different? Like, would you try something else? Like, at least experiment as, a, as a, any good scientist, you certainly are. Yeah, I think one learning point from it is probably the learning point that many people make as they develop their own games, which is, you know, start simple and do as much testing as you can up front and get things to users as quickly as possible. So you know how people will actually use what you're making. And I think that's a very generic lesson that comes from this that people probably hear when anyone talks about how they developed a game. I think that it gives me pause about using a mixture of digital and a physical product in the same time. As I reflect on this, I think about what games do I play in my real life that use a cell phone and a card game? And I can think of only one. I know like the Unlocked series is like a escape room game that uses a mixture, but it's not a common combination. And perhaps that's for a good reason. And so I think that's something I would think twice about or certainly test early if I was thinking about using a mixed method on a future game. <laughs> as far as what I'm going to do, I'll probably claw that space back from the QR codes and put whatever I think is most important in that little corner of the card. Because, you know, with two and a half by three and a half inches to work with, you don't have much space. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's not too much to substitute them for. But, you know, maybe something else will come up. And in, in that sense, Michael, because I think I think it's a very valuable lesson. You said it seems kind of generic, but until until you actually run into that. And you probably will run into that more than once. Like we've seen here many guests who've run into things and you say, well, but I had heard this before and I still fell into like my own trap. You know, even people who are teaching these things can even fall into those traps every now and then. So I don't, it's, it, even though it might sound generic, as you mentioned, Mike, I do think that it's, it's, it's important for us to, to sort of constantly reinforce these kinds of messages and you know, especially so that when you run into that, you you realize that it's okay. That, I mean, it's it's the kind of thing that can happen to the best of us. Um, but the important thing is to be able to, you know, sort of get back up and pick up your, your mistakes and, you know, do that next iteration, which will definitely improve things in, in a massive way. And, and then, you know, continue moving forward and maybe even moving on to your next thing. And, and talking about moving on to the next thing, I'd like to know of a, of a big challenge that you faced and you said, well, I'm trying to solve this challenge, this issue. And you, of course, used some sort of game, some sort of, you know, gamified strategy or something similar to solve. And, you know, at some point, eventually you actually managed to do something that you were happy, satisfied, successful with whatever you want to you want to go for. Yeah, I've been using some form of game or gamification for teaching as long as I've been teaching in the clinical setting. So that's, you know, five years of, of faculty life and a couple of years of residency before that. And the challenge that I started with and the challenge that I continue to have is I work in a sort of chaotic setting. So much of our teaching is in these work rooms where there's going to be six doctors working and phones ringing constantly and you know, all kinds of things that need to be done, you know, that are not emergencies. And then, you know, the people throw, you know, you throw in a couple of real emergencies there too. So teaching in that kind of setting is extremely challenging. And if you just set up with a PowerPoint or even sometimes just at, you know, a lecture at the whiteboard, the first time a, a doctor gets a phone call that they need to address, the odds are that they're not going to check back in. They're going to address that phone call, log into the computer to put that order in, and then then they're gone. Then they start typing their notes. Then they start catching up on what, all the work that they have to do because they do. They have so much they have to do. So I find that using a game is a good way to that just little you know marginal improvement of engagement is enough to draw them back to the table. So they do address that issue. They do address that phone call, but they come back because they want to get their next turn in and they've got that card in their hand. They've got that thing they've been waiting to do that can bring them back to the table even after interruption. So I think that's something that I found gamification has been really helpful for. Absolutely. And in fact, I would say I would almost argue that using games or using gamified strategies is, is probably one, one of the main gears that it works for is bringing back that engagement or bringing it in in the first time, you know. If you're facing some engagement issue or some motivational issue inside, for example, a class, as you were mentioning, and again, it's not because they are entirely disengaged necessarily or because they're not interested. In this case, it's because, you know, they got some interruption that they cannot avoid. And I'm sure that in the medical field, especially this will be, you know, more common than we would like. 
And then they just, as you said, they clock off. I mean, it's over for them because coming back in requires a lot of attention and a lot of things. So how do you do it? The massive solution that you've realized that you could use is, you know, again, bringing in a game, bringing some sort of gamified strategies to have people have yet another reason to be, you know, sort of present and 100% into your class. Is that right? Yeah, I think that works really well. Fantastic, fantastic. And when you're thinking again, you're in your class, you're, you're you're designing maybe a new a new class or a new session or a new program. Imagine you're doing that right now, or maybe maybe you are, uh, maybe you're there. What like what are the steps that you do to introduce maybe a game into your classroom or to use these gamified strategies? Like, do you have some sort of process, some thought process, some steps? How do you do it? How do you approach it? I almost always start by just printing things out getting physical things in my hands and playing with them. For me, a lot of times this means, you know, getting photos out of textbooks and getting them printed at CVS. So I have a bunch of like clinical pictures that I can use for whatever, you know, content. I teach a lot of like derm or like skin conditions. So I think having those physical pictures to arrange and think about, oh, how could we really play with these? How could we make this engaging? I think that first step, having something physical in your hands is usually what I do first and not do too much you know, iteration in your head or on the computer. Right. So what you mainly do is you start, you're thinking, you're using the content that you have, which is already pretty visual. I'm guessing if you're working with skin, you usually have to take a look at what the, the I'm guessing again, I'm, I'm an engineer. I couldn't be further from understanding medicine in any capacity, but I'm guessing here that it is already very visual. It's something that you have to visualize to analyze. Is that right? Yeah, I use games a lot for visual content because I want something tactile for that. I want something that they can hold and turn and look at. And so I think getting that physical presence is a much easier way to think about how it can be used in a gamified situation or or just generally how you can teach it best. Absolutely. So you're bringing sort of that physical and visual element into the classroom. You're sort of printing out all those things so you can, you know, you can use them for something. And what would maybe be the next step? Like, what do you do once you have all of that information, whether you use it all or just a part of it? Like, how do you, maybe how do you structure it? Of course, there's a, of course, a logic in the content that you're delivering, but how do you, how do you put it forth? I mean, if, do you try to go for a card game like the one that you have? Do you look for a game that's already existing and and bring it into the class and see how to apply? Like, what would you do with all that information once you have it there? So I guess I use games in a lot of different ways, but let's stay on the pictures. Like, so the visual diagnosis sort of ones, I sure. I almost always end up with some sort of very simple, like I, I always shoot for things that take like 10 minutes or less, like quick games that we can do. And if we get interrupted, it's okay. Not too much time is lost, or we could probably finish it before an interruption. So for those kind of things, using just, you know, simple games, it's always getting those pictures together, sorting them into patterns and finding out what pattern do I want the students to identify And how can I have them make that? So either taking, there's many conditions that affect the skin in another part of the body. So we take pictures of a skin condition and pictures of the x-ray or MRI of the other part of the body and say, hey, here's a big pile of pictures. Why don't you sort them between the ones that are the skin findings with the other part of the body matching? So like a simple matching game, like, or here's a picture of kids doing lots of different activities. Why don't you sort these in the order that a child would be able to do them in normal development? A lot of the visual stuff is, you know, not, we're not talking about very complicated games for these sort of teaching points. So you're, it seems like you're using them very much both for, you know, sort of recall, like recalling some sort of information that they probably either already have or are already studying so they can sort of practice that muscle of having those things incorporated because I'm sure you, you I mean, you doctors have to have so much information in your heads so you can analyze cases when they come in. And the other one is, of course, that analysis tool that you're putting together things and maybe somebody comes up with the combination that you didn't even think about before, right? Yeah, the interesting things happen. <laughs> that's always nice. Certainly. That's always nice. So that seems like a very interesting approach as well. Like you have all these things coming on and bringing them together. And of course, if you're if you're getting people sort of a different way, even to just the traditional things that, that they are probably used to in their education, it's already being more dynamic. You're getting people to be active on their learning. And this is definitely going to be beneficial, in my opinion, to their capacity to learning these things. Yes. And I, if I can piggyback on that, I think like something I've like evolved through the time is the quality of the physical materials is important. And I think it does help with engagement. Like 
at first I would just write things on sticky notes and we would sort and trade and that was engaging and that did help. But, you know, you see the looks on people's faces and you see in like people that you're not even supposed to teach start coming to the table when you do have like nicely printed pictures or the formal card game. Really, it brings in like random people that I'm not even supposed to be teaching to come play to have something that really looks good on the table. (laughs) So they're actually being drawn into that, even though it's not their thing, at least not at that moment. So that that speaks very highly exactly of that, what you're doing and, and the motivation and the engagement that you're getting from your and even other students as well. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. But Mike, would you say that there is some sort of, and maybe we've been like dancing around it, but do you think there is some sort of best practice or or some sort of, you know, idea, element strategy that you'd say, well, when you're thinking about introducing these games, these gamification elements into your classroom that you would probably benefit from doing or, or, you know, be risking possible failure if you're at least not thinking about including it? Again, an element, an idea, strategies, or there's something along those lines that you would maybe call sort of a best practice. I think one thing that I've learned is people have very specific expectations of what a game is and how a game is played. And when your time is limited, it's best to like be within those expectations of your learners. Like at one point in developing Empiric, the card game, I had a set of rules that I I had developed to make it less stressful to try to like encourage like a feeling of safety amongst the medical students that they could just, hey, there's a mechanism that you look at the card instead of just guessing. And I could not get people to play by those rules because those rules did not feel like a normal game to them. So I think being as close to people's expectations for what a game does is a very good practice to kind of make things go quickly and make things go smoothly as you're introducing a game into a, like a situation in which games are not typically expected. So I would say it's something like, you know, sort of living up to the expectations of of a game being a game and, and what that means for, especially for your audience in particular. And there, of course, you have to consider what your audience thinks in that sense, because I'm, I'm sure that what they were thinking maybe was different from what you were thinking and what others would be thinking. So, so something along those lines, right? Yeah. And keep it simple. I think that's super important. Yeah. The KISS principle, keep it super simple, right? Oh, I'm not familiar with that term, but that's perfect. <laughs> well, yes, the, thank you. The super is sometimes substituted by stupid simple, but but I like the super simple a lot better myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, after, you know, I, I know you've heard some episodes before as well. I mean, after having the whole vibe of the podcast, is there somebody that comes to your mind? Like when I interviewed your colleague, Teresa Chan, she mentioned you. Is, is there something or somebody that you would like to have in the podcast as well to listen to, to learn from this this person in Professor Game? I'm not sure how far down the medical um, rabbit hole you're intending to go, <laughs> but if you're if you're staying in these circles, uh, Todd Chang is at my institution and had done it's it's drifting more into he's done some video game work, but also a lot of VR and simulation. And of course, simulation is critical in medical education. And he's done I've seen him speak on some of his work with heart rate monitors of the participants and cortisol samples of the participants. And, you know, talking about how we're, you know, we optimizing the the right amount of stress and the right amount of engagement in our learners so that they're not disengaged or not, you know, overly stressed so that they're learning. So I've seen him speak and he would be an interesting person to have on the podcast. Yeah. And even introducing some of the medical terms that are (laughs) relevant for the field. I mean, you know, talk about the cortisol and all these things and all the chemistry and all the, you know, all this, these things that you were mentioning it that I'm I'm not going to try to say again correctly because I'm I'm probably going to fail because it's definitely far away from my specialty. And it sounds like a very interesting guest as well. So that sounds like it's going to be a recommendation where we're going to take a look at as well. Definitely. And Staying in that field of recommendations, Mike, would you say that there is a a book that you recommend an audience like this one? Again, thinking of people who are thinking, considering, or even currently using games and gamification, you know, especially for education, but not necessarily. Is there something that you would recommend? Again, direct inspiration from, you know, game design or something that is related or not so related. What would you recommend an audience like this one? I ha- I'm embarrassed to admit I pretty much only read fiction at this point. I mean, I read you know a lot of articles, but I don't read a lot of books. So I, I'm a little bit at a loss at what to recommend as far as a book for your listeners. I live in Southern California here, so I have a lot of commuting. So I try to take a lot of my, my a lot of my input is audio. <laughs> so it's a lot of podcasts and that's um, fantastic. You know, that's fantastic. You, you'll probably audacity. want to try the audio books as well. Yeah, it's that I find audio books very difficult for like educational content though. Huh. 
That's true. I hadn't thought about it. I, to be honest, I, I, I'm still a sit down reader. I haven't gone deeply into the audiobook space. I kind of explored that quite a while ago. Uh, this is going to age me a little bit because uh, it was through cassettes. <laughs> <laughs> I still, I think I have it it's somewhere. No, probably not. My my old, like the house where I lived in, with my mom is sold right now. And I don't know if she kept that. She moved as well. Countries, it's probably not existing anymore. It was a series of cassettes. But I started doing that because my dad was a very, very strong reader and when he got, he was ill. He was very, very ill from uh, ELA. I, I'm not sure if those are the, the, the initials in English or in Spanish now. Yeah, uh, I don't, that doesn't... Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? ALS, sorry. ALS, ALS yeah. ELA is in Spanish. Yeah, I, I always get the wrong side of, <laughs> of these initials. And he, of course, he couldn't hold books at some point. So we, we kind of went for the audiobook, see how it worked. And that was, I, I'm trying to remember if there was anything after that for me in audiobooks, but it's true. I haven't, haven't done much of that since. And that was a while ago, as you can, as you can probably <laughs> tell by the technology used. So that's okay. I mean, if, is there any maybe fiction, maybe book or article or somewhere you'd like to, people to read that has particularly inspired you? Again, it could be from the story perspective. We've had guests who have recommended just reading fiction to get inspired or maybe something that, you know, the, the way that they approached the book was interesting to you. If there is, if, if there's not, we can just move on to the next, <laughs> to the next I mean, thing, which is perfectly fine. Some articles fine. I, I read at the very beginning of this by... Um Landers, I think he's been on your podcast, actually. He had a couple articles about just like the framework in which we, you know, we the way we think gamification works, you know, moderating and like mediating factors for how gamification works for education. I think that, that he has a pair of articles where he did that along with like a leaderboard thing that I think are pretty good ones to read. Um, gosh, I've got a whole list on my web page of articles I've been reading along the way, just so I won't forget their names. Um <laughs> You can you can um, share with us that, that link if that's public as well. Medicine was good. Sorry, um, and there's another one by Rutledge at all in academic medicine that was a pretty good one um, for gamification in the medical, like like hmm. framed around medical um, teaching that I thought was pretty helpful. Yeah, those were good. Uh, the other thing I would also recommend is like yeah, you know listen to regular game podcasts, not just educational, but you know dive into that sort of body of people making games for whatever reason. Um, and I think a lot of the same principles apply. I listen to a lot of, you know, those sort of podcasts as well. There you go. That's a pretty interesting source of inspiration as well. And what would you say, Mike, now you've been recommending other people, other books, uh, in your case, what would you say is one of those things that makes you sort of special in a way? And yes, you can brag here. That's, that's <laughs> perfectly acceptable. What's maybe your, your superpower or that sweet spot where you think, you know, this is the, the, the core thing that I know I can, you know, very much dig deep into these things when talking again about education, games and gamification. You know, I think that I'm someone that is absolutely having to be making something at all times. So I have that kind of compulsion to be building things that might not be a super unique thing amongst people who are making games. But <laughs> if I'm not like, you know, if I'm not drafting a game, I have to be painting or I have to be doing something, creating something physically. So I think that's definitely what's led me to, you know, dive into this area. Definitely that that's, you know, that whole building thing is always super, super important. And you know, of course, this is, is going to come out as a difficult question for some, but what would you say is your favorite game? I've been dreading this question. It's too tough. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to ask because you always ask, right? Um, I think I'm someone who really likes to explore a new game and to, to, to learn the rules and learn how to apply them. And I'm not someone that dives so deep to like mastery. You know, I like to just play a new game and then a new one and explore a new one, right? But right now I'm I'm really enjoying a game called Palm Island, which is this very unique little 17 card solo game that you can play with your hands without even a table. It's like your perfect buddy for quarantine or for um, safer at home, <laughs> a solo game. So I think that's one that I, I'm really into right now. And then uh, I've been playing Patchwork with my wife, which is a, a game designed just for two players, which is nice for, you know, the games that are designed just for two players and really work well in that setting. I think that's a great one right now, too. Fantastic. Those are those are probably great games. I haven't seen or, or played any of the two, but it sounds like they could be pretty exciting. And we're going to go, we usually have time for the extra random question, but this time, you know, after having two guests in medical education, I do have myself a question, you know, that could be a bit more specific to your field. And it has to do with why do you think in particular, like gamification and, and using games in your classroom 
in you know medical education has a specific impact like why would you say you know the the medical field has something special that makes you know gamification and the use of games very very useful for that field I think those of us that are doing it right now have the advantage of not many people are doing it. So the novelty is really helping us for engagement because I think if anything, medical education is behind other fields and use of games. And even probably, you know, as as our students are as time passes, I probably more and more of our students will have used more and more games through their undergraduate and, you know, whatever that's before edu- um, in their, their school and then their undergraduate education. So I think um, it's probably going to be more and more of an expectation. And those of us that are doing it now are kind of early on it in medical education, games per se. I think medicine uses a lot of simulation and for very good reason, right? We have these very high stakes situations like rare events that are very serious that we want to practice as much as we can with mannequins and with simulated situations for emergencies. So I think that there's a lot of simulation going on already, but games not so much. I think it could also be a, I mean, given precisely as you were mentioning, it's not only the digital and the, you know, the card games, but even the mannequins, that's, that's a form of simulation as well. But I would say that in that sense, you would actually have like a foot forward. Those people who have been doing a lot of simulation in the past as well, have a foot forward, uh, you know, versus somebody who is just, you know, starting and saying, oh, why don't we do these things like games and gamification? And I do think that the whole experiential, you know, sort of situation, so to speak, would be a good fit forward that you have, which is actually a very positive thing for the field of medical education. And and I love your answer in that sense of at least for now being the novelty at some point. The good news is that there will be more people doing it. The other good news is that that means that probably <laughs> things will start getting, you know, the quality will also be constantly improving. The, the, the not bad news, but the difficult news is that we will have to be improving ourselves as well yeah, while, while the field continues to grow. So, you know, that's exciting news is all I can say about that for sure. So, Mike, do you have any sort of, you know, final piece of advice or, or final words that you want to tell the audience before we move on? You know, the last thing I think I would leave people with that's worked very well for me is if you're thinking about getting into a game for whatever the field that you're in, I think get started on whatever social media is happening amongst your the cohort of people that teach what you teach or whoever like your end user is. I've had a Twitter account for my game for about a year and it's really been a great opportunity to engage with experts in the area of infectious diseases to get their input on the design of the game, the content of the game. And just to kind of hear the chatter of the kind of things that they talk about, what they think is important for doctors to know. Um, And that's really been invaluable in designing the game. So I think there might not be a lot of other people at your institution that are interested in games and especially or interested in games in the very specific area that you are. But there are people more broadly that are. And um, I think find those people early and start like floating your ideas by them early. And that's going to be a good way to start. So talking about connecting with people worldwide and using the internet for these things and finding sort of your tribe and your audience, how can we connect with you? How can we find Michael Kissimini in the world of the internet and the web pages, Twitter, like whatever it is that you want to share with us so we can connect with you? Yeah, I'm definitely, Twitter is the place if you want to engage with me. It's just my full name. So Michael Kosimini, C-O-S-I-M-I-N-I um, at, or at that on the Twitter platform. And then the game itself, well, it's out of print for um, COVID. It has its own web page with a print and play version, and that's empiricgame.com. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you very much for, you know, especially in these times when you have your parental leave, <laughs> your time is particularly valuable. So thank you very much for investing this time that you, you invested during the interview. And of course, if you had any preparation as well, thank you very much for all of that, for all the wisdom that you dropped here, all your experience as well. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast. And if you want more interviews with incredible guests like Mike Cassimini, then go to professorgame.com slash subscribe and get started in our email list. That way we can be in contact and you'll be the first to know of opportunities new things that happen, some suggestions and readings that I that I can give around, and of course, be able to interact through that medium as well. And before you go on to your next mission, if you are curious about what we'll be talking about on the next episode, then you will have to subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there. <laughs>